my name is Leanne Patasimisak Simpson. Um, I'm from the Bobcat clan of the Michisagi Kanishinaabek Nation, and I'm a member of Alderville First Nation, and I'm in Nagojawani, our Peterborough today. Um, I'm a writer and a musician and an academic, and I've been uh, engaged in land immersive education for 20 years. The last seven years I've been an instructor in at the Chinta, and I'm also a member of the board at the Chinta. Um, my name is Glenn Colthard. I'm a member of the Yellowknife Stane First Nation. I'm a professor at the University of British Columbia in the, uh, in the Critical Indigenous Studies program, and I've been with the Chinta for the last 10 years. Hi, folks. I'm Alex Wilson. I'm from the Opaskwayak Cree Nation, uh, which is located in northern Manitoba or surrounded by northern Manitoba. Um, we're in Treaty 5 territory, and I'm a professor at the University of Saskatchewan in the, the Department of Educational Foundations and uh, also the director of the Aboriginal Education Research Center there. And we have a master's land-based program and in indigenous land-based knowledge. And um, so we've been working on that and then also working with different communities who are doing land-based ed from K to 12 as well. Uh, that's a good question. Um, I've been engaged in uh, land-based and community-based education uh, in the North for about 10 years now. Um, and I think what drew me to it was, uh, first of all, um, um, some concerns I had with the way in which uh, Western education institutions are detached, not only detached from um, Indigenous communities and concerns, but also um, replicate some of the violences that we have seen. So when I think of land-based education, uh, it first came through an understanding that in order to break the relationship between um, the violences of colonialism and the Western educational um, system, um, which uh, worked in concert over, over a couple of centuries, or a century at least, um, to dispossess Indigenous peoples of their lands and to contribute in essentially a genocide against Indigenous people, uh, that we had to break that relationship. And one of the ways that I, that I hoped to break that relationship was by taking, um, uh, taking an, a, uh, a land-based, community-based approach um, to dismantle those systems. And if any sort of decolonizing education is going to uh, be worth um, be worth the pro or the paper that it's it's written on, it has to reconnect to and center land um, as a pedagogical foundation for that. I guess for me, I think about it in terms of Anishinaabe life, and I think that um, this kind of land immersive or land inherent education for me is about building the next generation of knowledge holders and, and elders, and I think that um, it's a very, very old, very ancient way of relating to each other and of sharing knowledge and of sharing experiences and it provides an opportunity to um, gain an understanding of the knowledge the practices and the skills that provide the the politics and the ethics and the practices that bring forth Anishinaabe life so i see this kind of education as as being um as being normal and as being being about creating and then living in Anishinaabe worlds. Mm, yeah, I like that. I, I agree with that too. And I think um, I would add that it's, um, it is a continuity of energy that, uh, you know, links us to the wider universe. And it's work that we've been doing since the beginning of time, really. And so, uh, one thing about land-based education, uh, sometimes we don't say Indigenous land-based education, but I think 
in the context of our conversation between the three, the four of us, that there's it's implicit that we're talking about indigenous land-based education. Um, I'm I'm thinking about the story that I often tell and is. Uh, on the drive from Saskatoon to Opaskoyak, there's uh, this gravel road called the Tote Road, and lately they've been logging that road. Um, they've been clear cutting the forest, the boreal forest in that region, so it's really drastic and dramatic and, and evident as well. And a couple of winters ago, I, I have a photo of this. There's a pile of logs there, it's all old growth boreal forest that's been cut. And the pile of logs was almost a kilometer long. And um, if you think about all of that knowledge that was cut um, in those logs, uh, you know, because it's the first time those that forest has been cut, um, think of those logs as elders, and then think of the next generation of trees coming up. Like, who is going to teach that next generation of trees how to be trees? if you know all that knowledge is gone and all those logs you know all those trees are gone um so that's kind of a parallel to what's happened in some many ways to our to us as people as indigenous people is that there's this been sever severing of knowledge an intentional severing of knowledge through different policies and practices um so who's going to teach the next generation of uh of our people to be in relationship in different relational ways in um, accountable ways to to the land and land includes sky and water etc so to me land-based education is reconnecting or or maintaining or ensuring that connection between one generation um, continues to the next generation so we're fortunate in that we haven't been clear-cut Although we have experienced genocide, um, we, you know, and we have experienced the severing of land-based knowledge, which can be called epistemicide. Um, but so to me, land-based knowledge is kind of undoing epistemicide and epistemic um, violence that has happened, and then also violence that's happened on our bodies as well. And so there's a, an element of knowledge um, generation and sharing with the next generation but also um, mobilization or um, protecting the land as well so that's kind of my my understanding of it and I would say that it's very contextual so all of us will have a little bit of a different understanding depending on where we come from Um, well, I think that uh, sort of I'm sort of working right now in a Dene context and I'm working in an Anishinaabe context and those two contexts are quite different. Um, so it's very difficult in the Williams Treaty area to have access to land and access to water. So you can actually go out and engage in any land-based practices without being confronted with dispossession and colonialism um, in a very sort of real way that's a, that's a, a solid barrier. Um, a lot of us are living in, in cities, even in our territories, and so um, the challenge is to, it's a, it feels like a, a real act of resistance to be engaged in, in any kind of land-based practices, whether that's um, fishing or hunting or medicine gathering or ceremony or ricing or sugar bushing. And it actually puts a target on your back in terms of, of racism and white supremacy. So it's, it's also inherently risky um, because of the, the white supremacy in, in Canada. So I think another big part of it, like Alex was saying, is that um, the closer that you are to the land, the more that you realize the land is struggling and that the land is contaminated and that the land is, is struggling under the impacts of uh, global warming and under industrialization and contamination and encroachment. And so 
um, that also becomes difficult because it, we often don't have these amazing, beautiful, pristine places to go and feel renewed. Um, they're more conflicted than that. There's a, there's a, an aspect of grieving. There's an aspect of, of sadness. And there's an aspect of um, kind of refusing that uh, anti-colonialism that has got us into this place in the first place. And I think that's why, to me, uh, land-based education is extremely important right now um, because it uh, I'm thinking of, of the pandemic and some of the the challenges that we faced with having reserves closed and having crown land closed and having um, provincial parks and national parks so basically the wilderness is closed um, and then having our elders being very very careful because they're in high risk uh, groups and so they're, they're quarantined. Um, but the land also is still there and the land is still teaching. And my ancestors have lived through five, six, seven pandemics. They socially distanced for a decade in the middle of the 1600s. Um, being alone with your immediate family um, in isolation was be a practice that we did every winter. And so watching um, my daughter actually here spent a lot of time in land-based education cope with the pandemic. It's so similar to, she, she goes back to her toolbox from, from being at the Chinta. Um, like what do we do when it, it rains for, for 10 days and we can't, we can't get out? Well, she gets out the box of strout and beads and, and canvas and she starts doing inside crafts. What do we do when everybody's getting uh, sick of each other and things are getting a little snip snappy in the house? Um, we go for a really long walk. <laughs> and so it's interesting to see her sort of apply a lot of the skills that we have at Dechinta in terms of governing the community to the situation that we're in in the pandemic. And that was uh, something I hadn't thought of before, um, that those skills that, that we're teaching in terms of governance, in terms of managing emotions, in terms of solving conflict, in terms of um, working really hard with what you have um, and, and fixing problems with what you have. And I think of that last semester when it was raining and raining and raining and the elders made like massive kind of tarp uh, shelters for everybody um, just based on what we had on the island and I think I think that that kind of communal uh, relationality and that politics of, of getting along together in a community with what you have is a critical part of land-based education that you can't really get anywhere else right now. Yeah, yeah, I'm just thinking about that too. And, um, you know, thinking about uh, <laughs> there's, you know, the um, linking this back to the pandemic too. Uh, for a while there, it was um, really just sitting and looking out the window, <laughs> like for days on end. But uh, for me, it made me realize like how much is really out there. So I saw so many interesting things just outside my window like uh just a few weeks ago a bobcat and or sorry a lynx and a fox went by together and i watched them walk across the lake and and then they were they were obviously together because the lynx kept getting ahead and then it would stop and look back and wait for the fox kind of like you know hurry up and then they trotted across and then something must have scared them and they went went back and the fox was like really yelping on the way back but the the yelp was like the fox was in heat so there was this little kind of coupling going on but I'm not sure what what exactly was happening but so it made me think about um like is this stuff always there and we just don't notice it and now I've just had this kind of luxurious moment of being able to sit and look out of this window every day for hours and hours when I'm supposed to be doing other things but but really it um it just reminded me that um yes everything is always there and um we like have to slow down practice just you know to even notice 
and then to notice the changes in the land that, that Leanne was speaking about. And like in our territory, um, we've been impacted by, um, by Manitoba Hydro on one side of our the Saskatchewan Delta by Sask Power on the other side. So there's two major dams that were between. And then the Husky oil spill also impacted the river system and then uh, runoff from big commercial farms. The phosphates get into the river, like from the fertilizers, and that impacts the river, the river system. And then the American um, Ducks Unlimited Corporation has really damaged the area through making um, thousands of little channels and, and so-called micro dams. And they're still doing that, and they've been doing that for decades and decades. So I think um, land-based education is important right now because people are, um, where they're able, they are noticing in, in ways that they haven't noticed before. Or maybe they have always noticed, but in the past, maybe, you know, couple of decades for sure, uh, our, our way of noticing and, and reacting to that observation has has kind of changed because it's more about, you know, doing work that you have to do or our everyday busy lives. And so the the pandemic has kind of allowed for a slowdown. And I don't know if that also meant that the animals have noticed that we've slowed down and now they're kind of coming in more to their, like, to change the range of where, you know, the territories that they've been pushed out of. Like, are there more animals now, really? Because a lot of people are saying that. Or is it just that um, we're giving them more space and stuff? So land-based is, um, to me, important because it's allowing that relationship to kind of be nourished again. And it's allowing us to notice things, changes, minute changes in the environment and big changes as well. And um, uh, like because our area like other regions are like highly restricted now uh, people aren't really supposed to be going out trapping only one or two people like a family unit um, so some people are doing that but others that have been able to more depend on wild food we haven't been able to do that as much so people are are really sharing on learning how to share food and knowledge again in a different way and it's not necessarily through online, it's, um, it's happening um, kind of through word of mouth too and these mm -hmm. um, kind of meetups. So, you know, like someone in, you know, people have been doing this ninja thing where they drop off wine and snacks on people's doorsteps. But what's been happening a lot in our community is like people will drop off food. And so the, the link to food sovereignty, I think, is important as well. Um, yeah, those are the things I've been thinking about, um, destruction, yeah, that's, it's just so evident, and, um, if the next generation doesn't have any kind of real love and relationship with, with the land, then how will they care about it, so I think it's, you know, putting the brakes on and going back to kind of, really important values um, about what a relationship is and what it means when a relationship needs nurturing. Yeah, so to place my own kind of life or what I do as an educator in context, I think land-based education became really important to me. Um, in a very personal way of kind of trying to rebuild myself. Um, I had grown up on Satu Dene territory as a kid, um, which meant that I had a lot of access uh, to the land when I was a little one. Um, and, then, and then especially in the summers, we would spend um, a significant amount of time on the land with my, brothers and, my brother and sister and my mom um, with, with our family in Deda. So that was, it was a pretty like immersive sort of context where it was just part of one's life. I wouldn't say that I learned a lot, but uh, I was I was comf I was comfortable 
um, being in that in that environment, and then uh, and then getting closer to high school, we moved to uh, to Kelowna, which is a really violent place in terms of native non-native relationships. And as a teenager in that context, I kind of purposefully retreated from that part of myself um, to the point where it became no longer comfortable um, in my own skin. So when I started becoming more active politically, kind of uh, in in uh, in my late teens and early 20s, I started re-engaging with that or re-acknowledging that sort of um, that aspect of who I was, um, and especially did so once I started going back to school. Uh, but the, but what I was learning about Dene history and politics and ethics and the centrality of the land in terms of our understandings of freedom and well-being, um, I felt it was really there was something missing in terms of that that approach to understanding the issues that we were facing, but also the ways in which we were developing a form of political critique, whether it's like dispossession, capitalism, racism, gender violence. Um, I felt that I couldn't learn that stuff from books and that I was less, there was something missing in terms of, uh, of who I was, but also my understanding of that. Um, and, and that's when I started kind of really kind of understanding that in order to understand these issues, I had to rebuild myself by rebuilding that relationship with, um, with land and community. Um, so I purposefully kind of as my own, um, as my own both intellectual, educational, but also personal sort of reconstructing myself after the kind of the experience that I had as as a teenager living in an urban context in the south um, felt the need that it was really important that I that I start kind of re-engaging with these practices and these relationships um, and and it was only after like uh, doing that that I came to see how important this was to education. Like I would, I would, by this time I was well set off to be, be a teacher of some sort, um, professor, whatever you want to call it. And it seemed to me that you couldn't, you couldn't understand these issues that the Denny were facing. I couldn't understand my own sort of the impact that this had on me, uh, colonialism or violence or whatever. Um, without understanding the kind of perspectives that were disclosed to me through re-engaging with community on the land. Uh, so so land-based education for me came explicitly through this, this kind of personal history and the reconnection that I really worked hard to establish, even though I was struggling with kind of like notions of shame or even being like initially kind of being reintroduced to the land, being scared of it. Um, I don't think I could have come to um, who I am, uh, who I am as an instructor or teacher or who's in, in the business of education or even who I am as a scholar without re-going through that rebuilding process and, and particularly rebuilding the relationship to land. What you were saying there um, just reminded me of um, my own childhood and how, uh, you know, how, you know, we don't really talk about land when you're kids. It's just like you're playing outside, right? And how, how that, how important that is in, um, in understanding like, um, well, I guess just you know, our early beginnings as researchers, for those of us that are research, research nerds, but, you know, understanding how to play and, um, you know, how, how high you can, how far you can walk into the water before you get a booter and, you know, how, how you can like play on the ice before it breaks and then making rafts and little things like that, that really, um, you know, our families have done for, forever and um just the importance of of the the playful aspect of it i guess as well so i guess the normalization of of our relationship with land and i think um for myself as well you know leaving uh to go away to university um was kind of a, a reminder too that coming back um 
after university had to meant a kind of a reacquaintance with and like what does play look like as we're adults so that's something I always think about too and ask students like how can we kind of reignite that playful aspect of our relationship with land so that there isn't that fear because I think a lot of people um, and kids even are are really afraid like uh, for example like we have community gardens in OCN and kids are afraid to put their hands in the dirt even and so they don't know where the food comes from or or anything like that so so this kind of fear-based stuff is it's so pervasive in in society and I think even in a lot of the video games and stuff they're like they're about hiding and you know protecting yourself because you're afraid so um, you just reminded me again that uh, like that kind of playfulness is important to to um, help people allay their fears and just increase comfort level and land literacy I guess is what we could call it. I like that idea of um, the playfulness and the joy that Indigenous people get from being on the land because I think when you take um, when you take Dene students out at the Shinta and we're on the land for six weeks in a, in a community and people don't know each other, there can be a lot of fear and a lot of apprehension and a lot of shame. And those knowledge holders, those elders um, work really quickly and really hard, I think, to build, gener build relationships of trust and they do that through humor. And they, do, they make people safe by um, demonstrating uh, not in a performative way, but in a in a hardworking way, how much knowledge they have of the land and how safe we actually are wherever we are because of their knowledge and because of their skill. And I think that's um, that's part of land based education that's really beautiful to witness when you witness people um, kind of separating themselves from fear and anxiety and shame, and then. Uh, looking at their aunties and their uncles or, or elders that they're meeting for the first time with awe in terms of the kinds of skills and knowledge base that, uh, that these experts have um, and, and, and just watch that transformation. I think that that's really amazing. That from, um, you get that from immersive situations where you're on the land, separated enough from, from the rest of the world uh, for a long enough time that you can develop that, uh, those relationships of trust and um, the, have the time to develop a, a skill set, I think, as well. Yeah, like growing up, land-based education was not a formal title. It was just what you did, right? Um, everything you did, basically. Um, and then when you enter formal school, like that formal education system, uh, land becomes something out there, right? And um, not part of it. So uh, um, in our community, uh, around 30 years ago, I guess, they started uh, really, well, with when our own development of our own school system on our First Nation, there was this kind of like opportunity to now kind of go back to um, realizing and, and, and making it a priority, this connection to land. So the first thing they did was um, in terms of formalizing land-based education was pair elders with kids so they would have an elder go out with a trapper and that was really uh, um, important for a number of reasons but one is just that time that Nan was talking about um, the time to develop a trust trusting relationship but it's also of course learning you know learning from them and kind of a, a, a mentorship role etc um, and then there's kind of this period where land-based education became a punishment almost. Mm. And so when kids 
didn't fit the mainstream educational model. You know, they were skipping school. They were seen at, at risk or problematic. They were sent away to this um, school in Winnipeg that did canoe trips. And it was seen like, you know, a big punishment. So you didn't want to go. You didn't want to be one of those bad students, right? And then it became like um, localized as kind of students that didn't fit the mainstream model for um, a number of reasons, maybe cognitive or um, physical um, impairment. Then there was this kind of special program for them where they would do land-based. So it, it wasn't necessarily a punishment, but it was like um, an opportunity for kids to learn with um, that wasn't part of the mainstream kind of system. And so uh, today I think though what I've seen is kind of a change where now land-based land education is become almost a catchphrase because it's become so popular in particular in the past like five, four or five years. So now every school district in the prairies is doing land-based education. Um, but there's such a range of understandings of what it is. I think that it's, it is really important to have these conversations to say, well, what does it mean for you or what does it mean for your community or for your, you know, for your region even or whatever, because for some people it is um, just means doing activities outside. And that can be very problematic because um, uh, we know that, you know, some of the activities, you know, really just align with colonial um, patriarchal models. Um, and it is not really changing anything. It's not about land protection. There's no understanding of history or even any indigenous um, knowledge. Um, and then for others, it's culture camps. For others, it's um, forest, you know, the forest schools or the outdoor schools. And then for others, it's like taking mainstream curriculum and then just trying to figure out ways to do it outside. So there's such a vast range. So I think um, we've gone from, we've gone that whole kind of trajectory of different ways that land-based education has been understood. I think that for me, um, when I look back 20 years ago, what land-based education was something that I think Anishinaabe people associated with white people with the outdoor schools and outdoor bound and canoe trips and scouts. And um, I was motivated to get into this field, I guess, because of elders and knowledge holders and their absolute concern that as they were dying, they weren't being replaced. And so the massive amounts of knowledge and practice that were being lost um, was an absolute concern and so they were really driving this idea of getting elders and youth out on the land um, centering Anishinaabe knowledge holders and Anishinaabe knowledge having the critique um, because they were already doing the critique um, whenever they were would tell stories or, or talk about residential schools or being run off their track lines or being confronted by by clear cuts. So that was already a part of an Anishinaabe education. Um, and then bringing in things like like language and ceremony and and uh, and culture. So I think um, what we were trying to do is was something very very different we were trying to build anishinaabe worlds we were we were inter interested in in rebellion and revolution and and figuring out a, a different way um other than heteropatriarchy and colonialism and capitalism of living and um that's what was what was driving it it wasn't um and it was coming from from very ancient ancient ways these this was the way that these folks were raised um, before they were stolen and taken away to residential schools and um, and I think you know I was thinking about that last night in terms of, of the anti-black racism that we're seeing 
all over Canada and the U.S. right now and the mobilization and the idea of, of abolition and defunding the police and building societies where you don't have the problems that necessitate having that kind of um, surveillance and that kind of policing violence. And these, these folks were born into that. And so I, I always go back to that because that motivation was very intimate and very personal, but it was also really, really collective. There was a, a lot of um, a lot of heart in 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 that drive towards towards education that made sense. That was that was moving towards building a different world. Yeah, I think that the what I've seen change over the last 10 years mostly has to do, um, there's a, a certain amount of um, legitimacy, I think, that has been afforded what we're calling land-based education um, by, by institutions um, in the, in the post-secondary realm. So, uh, when we first were trying to advocate f uh, as this as the land informing critical thought and perspectives and practices, um, it fell on it fell on deaf ears. Like people often wouldn't listen. It was still thought of as oh, you're just having a classroom outside. Um, our derogatory assumptions about that's not education. That's just work or labor. Um, or crafts so we really had to battle this understanding that what you're learning from community and what you're learning through these practices in relationship to land and water actually could inform oneself intellectually and um, provide a critical framework for better understanding not only your history and the situation that we find ourselves in as indigenous communities but also heaven forbid an like an like an alternative to um, to the the structures that that are keeping us thus down and keeping us away from our land and what it has to teach us um, but it's also like the more recognition and I'm not saying that it's, it's, I would say it's still, um, we still deal with the other forms of kind of understandings of land as more just work um, and land education as more um, just kind of developing certain, certain, certain technical skills over time. Um, but the more that it has been recognized as a source of criticality and knowledge that might inform our critiques of the present, but also our aspirations for the future, the more that it's been kind of attempted to be institutionalized in ways that take the edge off of those sorts of perspectives. So you see land-based education now almost synonymous with, um, with kind of pushes towards reconciliation um, in higher education. Um, you very rarely uh, hear land uh, based education in the way that Alex had framed it and the way that I think of it is teaching people um, the importance of land defense for instance um, um, and then of course when you're when you're kind of embedded in these colonial institutions or even have some like a semi-autonomous relationship to it um, it becomes hard to fight back in terms of the ways in which that recognition shapes what you're doing on the land and in terms of education so you now all of a sudden um, for legal or other reasons you have to you're you're being demanded to come up with some evaluation structure that te that um, against which you have to you have to grade students in certain sort of ways in order to make those institutions even under like in order to make sorry what you're doing legible to these very inflexible kind of western sorts of and colonial institutions and i think that that's one of the issues that we're always kind of either pushing back on or or um or trying to figure out how to best embody what we're doing and what the community is offering in terms of its knowledge um yet also understanding that 
Um, we're also rebuilding, like I, I feel like our institutions that we're building are, bu- are attempting to rebuild um, economies in radically sustainable sorts of ways. Um, we're paying elders or we're able to pay elders um, rightfully for the knowledge that they're sharing with us and willing to share with us. Um, we're providing otherwise very precarious workers with a, with a, um, with a, a, an income that allows them to spend time on the land instead of having to seasonally work in mines or other um, less desirable forms of community. Um, and in this way, I think that the, the land-based education that we're trying to support is also supporting a broader um, um, economy that isn't beholden to and dependent on the extraction practices and industry that is destroying the very foundation of that relationship to land. Um, and if that means we have to partner with universities on a, and hopefully some sort of semi autonomous way in order to kind of provide a, um, like a, uh, less precarious form of, of, uh, program delivery, then we're going to have to just deal with some of those, those ways in which it, it can serve to co-opt us into, um, providing, into programming that is counter to to the purpose that we we got into the business to begin with, which was a critical um, pedagogical practice that can inform our politics against capitalism, against heteropatriarchy, to better understand colonialism, and to dream of different worlds and futures. Yeah, well, I think uh, just speaking about the masters that we have, um, it it came from a request from the community, from elders and other people, um, because they realized that the um, graduate programming that was out there wasn't really helping our communities that much. I mean, it was. It was um, turning out a lot of principals and vice principals and teachers but um, there was a, you know, a really um, important or, you know, valid concern that was raised that, you know, often just replicating the system. And that's what we've been talking about um, as one of the reasons that land-based education is so important. So they, they said, like, we, we need something where our teachers can... Um, have the opportunity to to go deeper in the knowledge around in, indigenous um, indigenous knowledge, I guess. And so, a lot of the stuff that was being done in the mainstream kind of edit men or um, graduate programming around indigenous education was kind of surface level. And our elders and knowledge keepers were saying, you know, you can't can't really engage on a deeper level, like a philosophical level, around some of our concepts and um, understandings of relationships that exist in the language, unless the land is part of it. So that kind of was the impetus for, um, that um, allowed us to start the land-based masters at U of L. And so, um, so in some ways, um, we kind of ignored the mainstream institution, but in other ways, like it's just so um, critical. It's just so um, frustrating sometimes because there's so many rules and regulations that were created for a system that really wants just wants to decimate and destruct land. And um, so the challenges have been like as simple as being able to pay an elder. Um, cash rather than having to having to have them wait for months and months you know for you know an invoice to be processed and then they get a check and is there a bank in their community all of those things um to um having to fill out excessive safety forms and regulations and i understand the concern around safety but you know for to me working in a lab with 20 chemicals that can potentially blow up a building 
um, per, you know, makes more of a risk than than um, going outside and working with the land, but it's not seen that way. So you start to see this hierarchy of, of values really, um, really magnified when, when we're doing land-based work within the institution. Um, but I think there are, um, I think that uh, people have done really great in kind of finding ways to undo the system, like by hack hacking it in different ways, so to speak. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's an ongoing frustration for sure. I think that in thinking this through, I have two primary concerns. And the first is our, our knowledge holders and our elders and um, supporting them through this time and our ability to sort of funnel resources into the community to support that bush economy and support community members getting out on the land. And then our students, um, Indigenous students, because I think in both Alex's program and the Dishinsa program, we have really, really, really amazing Indigenous students who have the ability to um, affect profound change in their communities. Um, and I think that uh, we can't abandon them at this time. I, when I think of the term, um, I, I worry a little bit about the term land engaged. Uh, so I, I think that that term has to be kind of temporary and it has to be a stopgap to get us through the pandemic and it can't replace land immersive, land based, um, land inherent education, Anishinaabe education, Dene education, um, because I think it would be very attractive to institutions to have land engaged. It's much, much easier from their colonial perspective and from an institutional perspective to deliver land engaged education. You don't need to pay the knowledge holders. You don't need to have camps out on the land. Um, you can do it on Zoom. You can do it in the classroom. It, but it also falls apart. Like, what if you had math engaged <laughs> education instead of math? Like, you're just sitting around talking about it instead of mm. doing it. So I think that this idea that um, that indigenous people, after everything that we've been forced to give up, are now forced to give up land as well. We had to abandon our language and we teach in English. We had to abandon our knowledge holders because the university can't figure out how to pay them. We had to abandon our knowledge systems because they don't conform to Western knowledge. And now we're going to have to abandon this as well. That's not okay in the long term. Now, having said that, because we have to have a commitment to our students and our commitment to our knowledge holders, what are the ways that we can, I think, go back to what Alex was talking about, having that one-on-one -on -one mentorship, but that requires um, institutions to be paying those teachers. Um, and then having facilitators like myself where students can come in and check in and talk about what they're, they're learning in these one-on-one -on -one mentorships in their own communities, which could be physically distanced. Um, so that's one kind of thing that I, I think might, might work. And it works a lot better for students that have already had some kind of taste of land-based education or already have relationships set up in their communities because the base of land-based education is relationships, it's relational. And you cannot develop the kinds of relationships of trust that Alex and I were talking about on Zoom and email um, if you've never met, met those elders before. So I think we have to be really honest about the risks and about what can and cannot be done. Um, you can't do land-based education on Zoom. It, um, you miss everything that's important and everything that's meaningful. Are there ways of, of getting students out on the land with, with knowledge holders that can be facilitated through, through Zoom and through online work as a stopgap and as a temporary measure during the pandemic, that's certainly worth exploring with both of those groups of people. <laughs> um, but we really have to fight against institutions sort of getting on this bandwagon that, um, oh, if they did it in 2020, then we don't need to go to Alex's community anymore. And we don't need to give the thousand dollars that you know, they might put towards supporting your, your land-based programs. Um, so we, we got to make sure that we don't lose the ground that we've already made. Yeah, I think I'm in a similar, or I share a 
very similar position. It's not a replacement, but um, but if this demand is made on us um, in order to get through um, this this emergency, um, then we 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 ought to we ought to take that seriously and, and think through these issues. Um, one of my concerns is um, one of the ways in which the Dene were driven off the land was by making um, a life on the land no longer economically sustainable. So it was like the kind of emergence of capitalism into the area, um, which changed the political economy of the price of furs and the harvesting and what you could gain from harvesting. And then people had to go start to work in mines and, and in oil rigs and stuff like that. Um, to the point where it could, they could like uh, being on the land was was ironically now uh, too expensive to be able to sustain one's oneself. Um, so being on the land now is a very costly endeavor, and what we're doing as an organization has to be um, has to have the resources to redistribute into communities so people can learn on the land. Um, by providing them with with a with uh, with salaries and uh, and 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 the money that they need to be able to do that type of stuff. So my concern is is if we demonstrate some significant or what is perceived as success as transferring some of this education online, then it gives people, it gives institutions, it gives government a reason to claw back on expending those very important resources that would get us out into, um, into communities and on the land and paying elders um, what they should be paid and paying land users and harvesters. So my concern is that if we actually like do this too well or what's perceived to be too well, um, then we're shooting ourselves in the foot by providing incentive to not, to not, um, fund these 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 critically important programs and then my second point is like this was the exact reason why i got into or kind of started to understand that immersive sort of need to um engage in land-based sort of practices because they provide a a framework um, for understanding the world and our possible futures that is irreplaceable like you cannot you might be able to somewhat approximate it in something like a book or learning it in these contexts, but you're not going to understand it in the way that it kind of radically transforms your body and your, and your identity and your subject and your subjectivity to use like a fancy world in ways that give you a like a clearer understanding of what needs to be done. What is the objects and like, what are the issues of concerns and what might we do to build something that's an alternative to it? All of that is missed if it's online. Like a Zoom, a Zoom meeting is is uh, even less <laughs> of a, is even um, has a less of a critical impact on how we understand the world than say than say reading does. Um, and and I just worry that if if we uh, if it's if it if this is kind of seen as an alternative to what we're doing on the land, um, then then uh, various powers that be, especially in like post economic crisis that we're kind of entering in, or like not post economic crisis, but into the economic crisis that we're clearly already in, um, they'll they'll start cutting the absolutely fundamental resources that we need to be able to provide this truly decolonizing um, education. I really worry about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, uh, you know, like we we're all expected just to move our courses online, you know, and then I was like, how, how the hell am I going to do that? Like, how do you move online? And then there's, you know, there's a lot of webinars popping up right now on land-based education online. And my worry with that too is this like commodification of it now and appropriation as well. Um, because now it's going to be reduced to sound bites almost. And so, like you said, like even reading is, 
you're establishing a relationship with the text and with all these other people that you know have that you're citing um and i don't know how that's done through video um and pe we know that people students um and others will just kind of zoom through things <laughs> you know and they watch little short 30 second clips and that's it so again there's really no opportunity for um the same kind of deep level knowledge um so so what's missing maybe is the spiritual component maybe that's that's something you know how do you how do you convey that um i did really love that term land engaged though but now leanne you pointed out some really um some important things to think about i liked it because it's action focused so my, my my immediate kind of image in my head around land engage was like, yeah, engage. But then as you were talking, I'm like, well, that's like engagement. You have to have consent. And how do you have consent if you're not actually in relation with the land? So that's kind of the first thing, right? So you can't be engaged to something without the other entity agreeing to it. So I guess that would go back to spirituality as well. And, you know, what are the, the things that we do to take care of one another as land-based educators? Um, like we've, the three of us have known each other. I've never met Glenn in person, but I feel like, you know, I feel very close to him. And I've spent time with Leanne over the years. So like that kind of building of our own relationship allows us to have this conversation. Um, and and we have our own relationships with our communities, our elders, and the lands, the different lands where we live and and operate and work, and and so that just like completely can be removed from the from anything if you're just kind of streaming videos. Um, so, uh, and then it becomes a product, right, or a deliverable. And that's kind of how grants work, but universities as well. So it links back to um, assessment too. So how are we going to do assessment now? You know, the university will like to see certain outputs, but again, how how do you describe a spiritual kind of connection and understanding and relationship and the responsibilities that go along with that that take time? So those are some concerns and thoughts. I really like um, like this one of the courses I'm doing this summer is Queering Indigenous Land-Based Education. And um, in that course, we've really been trying to think of ways to queer, like queer in terms of like undoing, turning upside down, um, but Kalani Young is a Hawaiian scholar, and um, when I'm talking to her about queering, she she uses the term queering. She says queering is transforming poison into medicine. So I like that transformative kind of element to it. Um, so thinking about ways that we can kind of queer this whole process. So any ideas people have, <laughs> you know, are are welcome. I wanted to sort of pick up Alex on some of the the risks in terms of of cultural appropriation and um, the commodification of indigenous knowledge in these contexts. And it reminds me of the kinds of conversations that we were having in like the late 1980s and the early 1990s around documenting traditional ecological knowledge and separating that knowledge from the knowledge holders and therefore separating it from the ethical system. Um, through which sharing is is governed, separating it from spirituality, separating it from the land, separating it from the the knowledge, and then that focus on almost the the data component. And I remember elders talking about um, by the time you get this document or the the video, the thirty second video clip of them harvesting a medicine, you're just getting the detritus of that. You're just getting the data. You're not getting the breadth of knowledge. You're not getting the depth. And we have so many, so historically and contemporarily, so much experience with having 
um, those those medicines stolen and appropriated, those designs stolen and appropriated, that technology stolen and appropriated. And so it's also a worry of mine of having this um, now so ubiquitous. Everybody has an iPhone. Everybody can um, film their elder and, and get it up online. And it's creating this sort of uh, body of knowledge that contains a lot of misinformation and contains a, a lot of information that can be appropriated and used against indigenous people. And we're not having that kind of critical conversation, which I think we will be having in the classroom. And we do, I know in land-based education, constantly we're talking about consent, constantly we're talking about um, individual self-determination. We're talking about whose knowledge it is, how you get to share it, what those practices and protocols are. And, and so that I think is also a big worry um, I think that I've learned the most about querying land-based education from the land itself because the land doesn't really conform to heteropatriarchy very well. And so it's been in these land-based um, situations where I've seen um, people not upholding the traditional sort of gender roles that they might uphold in the city or in the town where that kind of starts to fall apart when you're you're watching animals out your window <laughs> um, engage in, in in not heterosexual relationships when you're you're um, seeing how uh, how um, consent and how diversity and how um, that respect for individual self-determination and a really profound respect for diversity work together in a community um, that's where I feel like and the language too, when you start to be able to talk with fluent speakers about how, how um, oh, the word for earth is just a key. It's not actually mother earth, it isn't actually gendered. I think that's when I've, I've learned the most about that from the land. And so I, uh, I think again, the land is sort of the, the, the foundation of, of that learning. Mm -hmm. That makes me sad that we're, we have to have this conversation right now. I felt mm -hmm. like, I think a year ago, I would have been surprised that I, I've, <laughs> to look into the future to see me on Zoom um, with my mentors and my teachers and my colleagues trying to say um, in, in articulate terms that you can't do land-based education without the land. <laughs> in summary. <laughs> yeah, it seems so, like... It's like when you put it like that, it just seems ridiculous. <laughs> so, um, some of the stuff that I was thinking, though, is um, like if we are kind of forced to do this, um, as like Leanne says, as a as as just simply a stopgap, um, I think I think uh, some of the resources that we've redirected to do this type of work. Um, it should really be driven by what the community wants. So like we've been talking to Moreau Sundberg and some of the, the um, important language documentation um, that they want done. So hopefully whatever comes out of this will still be as of, of use um, to the communities that we, that we serve and we have obligations towards. Um, but I, yeah, and I still I still have that anxiety over it though. I'm just I'm thinking now. Um, uh, I like I have my syllabus from last year, and I was just gonna get them to kind of do do it on their own like in their own little unit and then some of the students decided on their own that they want to um because part of the summer was doing a canoe trip um on the saskatchewan river so they would see some of um the just the way that it's been impacted by the dam but also another part of the territory that they haven't really been on um so they're gonna do six of them are gonna do a, a canoe trip in their region in northern alberta um and then they're going to take the readings and do the assignments but to me i mean that's kind of that works um but now i'm thinking maybe a better way to 
frame the course would be to have them ask their community um, elders or um, people in the community what their most pressing need would be. Um, and then they could develop something around that for their more of a project based. I don't know. Um, now I'm just kind of thinking through um, what's going to have the most impact or or maybe it just shouldn't be that. Maybe it just should be like recognizing that COVID is the situation and um, we just have to do something different this time. Because you know, a lot of them are still in restricted travel areas and, uh, you know, are trying to do their child schooling and all of, you know, no daycare, all of those things do. So there's that whole element as well. But now I'm just thinking like, just what Leanne was saying there at the end is like, yeah, we shouldn't be doing land based by video. It's like, this is why they, you know, this is why they chose a land based program. So. I don't know. I actually think that's a really good approach to um, to figure out what communities and what knowledge holders and what students need right now and use that as the base basis to drive it because I think if we think about this as a temporary situation we don't have to if we can't deliver land-based education, there's still other things that we can do in terms of making uh, life life easier and life better and um, for, for communities and for students and for uh, knowledge holders. And so maybe there are things that we can do online that are not land-based education, um, but that are, are related like storytelling, like language learning and like the politics of of um, colonialism and that sort of uh, that sort of community care work that I think is is super important as well. So I think that uh, conversations with knowledge holders and students, um, figuring out what uh, where we can have the most impact given our resources and the situation that we find ourselves in is a good approach. As long as I have been a part of this organization doing land-based education in the kind of context that we do, um, it's it's been 100% about giving back to the community or making it relevant to the community. Um, even the post-secondary aspect, it was it came through community consultations on the barriers about the barriers that in, Indigenous folks in the North face when they want to pursue secondary or like a post-secondary education. It's about making sure that we can employ elders um, uh, in ways that they, they, they feel in which their, their knowledge is respected. Um, and, and that gets them um, living a life um, out on the land that would otherwise be very difficult to sustain. Um, so I think in the, in the interim, if, if, if this is something that we have to do, the uh, what we're doing still needs to abide by that ethic of giving back to the community. So, like, yeah. talk to, uh, like I've talked to elders and old old timer leaders who are like, "Well, um, let's let's get this history down through dialogue or social distance interviews." Like a lot of these people are passing on. And, and I know that that, that Kelsey and, and other De Chinta folks have talked to Moreau about about how this this awkward sort of moment that we're in, we might be able to justify more resources going into language, like, like language revitalization projects. Um, and then and then just and then and then kind of just ride ride through this this shitty moment. Um, until we can back, be back in um, forming our, our learning communities on the land again. Some of the smaller things that I've been trying doing with my students, um, um, like kind of citizen science things, and I found Max 
the Barons work very, very um, enlightening and helpful. Um, so like her baby legs project in particular, I, I think um, I did this with my grandnephews and it's a way to detect plastics in the water. And so things, things like that, um, the students have really enjoyed doing, but it's easy to do um, with making your own equipment. Um, so monitoring pollutants and, and plastics. So that one is just, you make a little um, catchment system that you can pull behind a boat or a canoe and it catches microplastics. Uh, because apparently there's microplastics in every single waterway in Canada, lake, river. Um, and then the other thing is this micro travel, which is like entering in to some kind of relationship with land, but it can just be like a, a small little handful of land, um, like a little square meter plot or a foot, you know, and just, um, and uh, recording that. And then the observations around the moon too um, have been helpful for students. And I've used that as, uh, as an activity for in all of my classes because I find that most people in general, even like science teachers, don't really have an understanding or um, think about how the moon and the earth and the sun and, and beyond that greater universe interact and impact us. So just doing those, starting with those moon observations has been really helpful um, to get people to start making those connections and understanding relationships in a, in a wider kind of scale and also helps understanding like this clearing of um, the binary that we put on nature. Um, so those are just a few like kind of nuts and bolty type things that I've been doing. I've uh, done that moon, that moon journaling too with students um, that I got from you and it's been, it's been really, really amazing. And then I've also um, expanded it to doing like a, a sunrise, sunrise and sunset one. Um, yeah. And uh, I think that those are really, really easy ways. And then also constellations actually. Yeah. Um, of getting students to connect um, to the land and urban environments and just record the reflections of that transformation. And then, yeah, of course, it's a window into clearing. What do you do for the sunrise, sunset? Just have them observe and, and reflect or do they do uh, something? Observe and reflect and then record um, the time. So, for, so at different times of the year, it's a, it's a, it changes. Mm -hmm. So not the phases yeah. like the moon, but the time. Yeah. yeah. So um, one thing I was thinking of having them do this year was that, but have them place a rock down, like to place a rock in the middle. And then, cause this is how the celestial circles are made. Yeah. And like my dad was telling me, talking to me about this. So to have them put, put one down, um, they could do one every day or they could do one every few days, one for sunrise and one for sunset, maybe, um, and then have a pin in the middle. And then I think that will help them understand, uh, well, the cycles, but also like how superficial sometimes the medicine wheel stuff is. Yeah. So then they get a better understanding of like really what that was meant to be. And then they can maybe, maybe start aligning some of those rocks with, uh, not maybe a constellation or maybe one or two stars within a constellation. Yeah. I was thinking about that, trying that this year. You've also done it um, because our Anishinaabe people used to um, mark the solstice by having a stick. And then when the stick um, casts the shadow and it lines up, when the sun is right overhead, this, the, the, our word for that is that it, the sun has stopped. Um, and so you can do that up to the, the um, solstice in June mm, and then okay. in December as well. Um, mm. So that's a cool thing too. Yeah. And I think doing the research around pandemics 
is something that um, people can do online, people can do in archives, people can do in their families. Um, like the amount of pandemic knowledge that my mom and my grandmother had uh, that I didn't know about until we got ourselves into the situation was amazing. So I think there's a lot of kind of oral history um, stuff as well that can bring students into the into the circle and into a closer relationship to their ancestors and to the land. <laughs>